right, so hello and welcome back. So today we are checking out uh, why did Italy switch sides in World War II? I have lights now. I have microphone close to my face because I'm not an idiot anymore. And we have a better camera, so hopefully this improves the quality of all the reaction videos. I finally said that. So there we go. If you want to watch the video uninterrupted, which I highly suggest you do, I suggest you click the original video in the description. Um, and go give them a like because they make the content they make is very good. This is the more in-depth version of this video. I will be pausing, so if that irks you, you should probably go watch the original video there. Otherwise, with all that out of the way, let's get to it. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. We've extensively documented the Allied campaign against the fascist kingdom of Italy in multiple videos. But in all of our examinations, we have never taken a look at the little-known Italian civil war that occurred between 1943 and 1945. This war was waged between Mussolini's puppet government and the brave yet underrepresented Italian partisans, who, at their high point, were in control of much of northern Italy. In this video, we will focus on the internal struggles of the Italian people against their oppressors, and its uncertain transition from fascism to democracy. He mentions the partisans, but the, technically the civil war was between the Republic of Italy and the fascist Republic of Salo. <laughs> and long story short, the south of Italy is fighting and the north of Italy is also fighting, more or less. The north of Italy has the um, has Mussolini in charge and the south of Italy technically has the king at this time, although he later advocate in favor of his son for the rest of this, but yeah. Fascism to democracy. By spring of 1943, Benito Mussolini's mishandling of the war had turned the majority of his political party against him. Though holding near total authority as prime minister, Mussolini was technically subordinate to the reigning king of Italy, Victor Emmanuel III, who could remove him from office at any time. But Victor Emmanuel was a notoriously cautious monarch, and had deliberately fostered the fascist regime in Italy to preserve his own authority. It was not until shortly after the fall of Sicily that opposition forces dared to approach the king, and it took multiple assurances from president of the Chamber of Fasces and Corporations, Count Dino Grandi, before he agreed to back Marshal Pietro Badoglio as the next prime minister of Italy. Emmanuel was desperate to cling to power, and viewed Badoglio as an easily manipulated underling who could be relied on to help him reassert his authority over Italy and negotiate a favorable ceasefire with the Allies. It's kind of what happened. Basically, simplified version. Um, when Sicily was invaded, uh, the Italian government just basically, because again, Mussolini was not like Hitler, and he was not like Stalin. He didn't shoot everyone and get rid of everyone that didn't disagree with him, okay? He actually had some opposition. Now, again, a lot of them were loyal in the beginning, but when Italy's getting invaded, it's about time to stop. So basically, his own party kicks him out of the party and removes him as prime minister. Now, the king is allowed to appoint the prime minister and de-appoint the prime minister at any point in time, just like the king of England right now, King Charles III and Queen Elizabeth II. Technically, by royal prerogative, they can appoint their prime minister and dismiss parliament at any time they want. They don't exercise that power very much, if not ever, but they do have that power. Victor Emmanuel III did have this power, but as I said, any other monarch and the Italian monarchy would have survived, more than likely. Victor Emmanuel III was not a, he wasn't the brightest monarch. He was also a tiny if you see photos of him during his World War I spree, wherever he was, he is an absolute tiny man. He's like 5 foot or 4'11". He is tiny. Um, that probably led to some issues. He will abdicate in favor of his son later, in around 45, 46, 47, when he's trying to re the monarchy be favorable. And his son actually was um, a lot better of a monarch, um, but I'll get to that whenever they have the Reformation. But if they don't, basically be lost by like a percentage point to get rid of the monarchy um and all the north basically uh, all the south voted for monarchy all the north voted for republicans and we'll get to why that is but the allies 
but even with Victor Emmanuel's backing, Grandi knew that a dangerous struggle lay ahead as several other members of the Grand Council were still ardent fascists who remained committed to the war effort. On July the 24th, the members of the Grand Council of Fascism met in the Palazzo Venezia to decide the fate of their nation. Outside, smoke still rose from ruined factories and Basilica of St. Lawrence, devastated by Allied bombing raids just five days prior. The mood was exceptionally tense, with Dino Grandi going so far as to conceal a pair of hand grenades under his jacket in case violence broke out. Though armed blackshirts surrounded the building, Benito Mussolini entered without his personal bodyguard and immediately launched into a furious defense of his own actions. Grandi replied with a speech that beseeched the king to resume control over the nation, and concluded with a vicious jab at the Duce himself, let perish all factions so that the nation can live. Arguments- And it, that is pretty accurate what's happening. The black shirts, by the way, are Stalin fascists. They're like the SS. Oh, broadly oversimplifying, they're like the SS except for Italy. They're fanatically fascists. Although, how well they fight, not very well, let's put it that way. Um, but they're his personal units. It's raged back and forth throughout the evening, as the various fascist members of the council rose to argue their points with the supporters of the king. After nine hours, the council was split over several Ordina del Giorno, or orders of the day, each outlining a radically different course for the nation. To break up this confused tangle of conflicting interests, Grandi demanded the unthinkable, an actual vote. The first to take place in the entire 15-year history of the council. To his immeasurable relief, Grandi's order of the day carried a majority, and a broken Mussolini was forced to deliver it to the king in person the next day. Victor Emmanuel then ordered his arrest, and informed Badoglio that he was the new prime minister. Within hours, huge crowds were swarming through the streets of all major Italian cities, defacing statues, chipping off murals, and making bonfires out of former fascist regalia. The As you can see, <laughs> Mussolini didn't purge every political party. He actually got voted out by his own party as a fascist government. So again, Italy was like fascist. Okay, probably oversimplifying here. The Italian fascism is very different from German fascism, okay? Just get that out there. I suggest you go watch the video by Tick. Um, I'll go put a link card up there, whatever, um, if I can. Otherwise, it's in the description to the video by Tick on fa fascism. Very, very complicated. It's not just right-wing, left-wing stuff, okay? But fascism in Italy was very different from what will happen in national socialism in uh, Germany. The Grand Council would disband itself shortly thereafter, bringing Italy's 21-year-old fascist regime to a stunningly abrupt and ignominious end. Unfortunately, this extraordinary political upheaval left many unanswered questions, most prominent of which was what exactly to do about the eight German divisions that began advancing into northern Italy on the day of Mussolini's arrest. King Victor Emmanuel was still backing a highly authoritarian government ruling under martial law, and his pleas for assurances of Allied support for the monarchy delayed the opening negotiations to take Italy out of the war. For you can't really fault him for that. I mean, they're going to have to try to stop the Germans. A lot of stuff's going to go down. Basically, a lot of the Italian units are basically just disarmed by the German divisions coming down. And yeah, the Italian people were really fed up with the fascists at this point. They had lost Africa. <laughs> they lost North Africa. They had lost... So Ethiopia goes first. They lost Africa. Now they're landing in our own country, and that was the final straw that broke the camel's back. They weren't, they weren't dedicated Nazis. There's a big difference between Nazi and fascists. For 45 days, the government struggled to assemble a coherent agenda, while the king relapsed into passivity. In the end, Badoglio arranged secret talks with the Allies, signing the Armistice of Casibele, which assigned Italy the role of co-belligerent against Germany, 
but the Allies refused to alter their existing timetable for the invasion of Italy, and Badoglio was unable to arrange a defense of the nation before being forced to publicly announce the armistice. In response, Case Axis was devised as an operation to disarm the Italian military and set up a puppet regime in northern Italy. On September 9th, with German troops racing toward the capital, Badoglio, Victor Emmanuel, and most of their government fled south into the waiting arms of the Allies. The subsequent power vacuum in Rome allowed numerous opposition parties to emerge from hiding, including the Christian Democrats, the Socialists, and the Communists, who quickly founded the Committee of National Liberation, or CLN. September. That's a lot to go over there. Okay. I'll just state some of the, the things that are going to be on my mind here. Okay. So, first of all, the armistice has to take effect. Blah, 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 blah. What happened? Basically, King, King Emmanuel, at this point, by the way, the monarch, as his duty, it's not even his right, it's his duty to the nation to take over at this point, in my opinion. Long story short, my opinion. But he can't at any point run the entire country. And this is one of the exceptional times that you should do so. Martial law is still in effect. The government, you can't get a functioning government. You can't have elections at this point. And he's still authoritarian. But again, Victor Emmanuel III is not a very good monarch um, and doesn't do that. If he, in fact, I don't know, did, he could have actually had a defense of Rome and he could have had a whole defense for the entire Italian peninsula because um, the army was still loyal to him more because again the entire army was still loyal to the king they take o's to do so they weren't the only ones that really wouldn't were like the black shirts but i mean they don't exist at this point so there's that for 45 days that happened for deliberations um and they could have kept rome and rome is going to be a very hard target to snatch back it's going to be a slog going up the italian peninsula and a lot of people are going to die because of the inaction of the king was also the starting date for Operation Avalanche, a massive amphibious landing at Salerno by the U.S. 5th Army. Their goal was the capture of Naples, which had already been heavily damaged by Allied bombing campaigns. Social order had almost entirely broken down thanks to the widespread arrest and detention of the Carabinieri, or Italian police forces, who had been deemed a monarchist threat by the German occupation. On the and that is not a far-fetched goal. Again, when I say a lot of the forces are technically still loyal to the king, I do mean it. These Carabinari, I don't know why I call them something else, but Carabinari, they are a royalist police force founded by decree from the king. They answer to him. They are, they are a militarized police force with their own structures, and they did fight in World War I, and they have their distinctive hats, and they also fought in World War II. Um, in the army. So you have to think like army police, but they also do dual roles. It's very hard for Americans to understand that, but uh, France also has the gen uh, the gendarmes, um, and they do that today. That's not what they originally were for, but today the gendarmes do the same thing as basically the Carabinari, except these guys are, have royal prerogatives. Deemed a monarchist threat by the German occupation. On the 12th, Colonel Walter Scholl took command of Naples and declared that up to 100 citizens would be executed for every German life lost. Scholl then ordered 240 Neapolitans living near the coastline to evacuate, making it clear he planned to demolish the entire port district to deny it to the attackers. This was accompanied by a declaration that all Italian males aged between 18 and 30 would be conscripted for forced labor, and a day later, Scholl dispatched troops to round up as many men as possible. This caused huge crowds of mostly unarmed Neapolitans to burst out onto the streets, their ranks augmented by a few soldiers who had managed to escape detention. The following chaos would be known as the Four Days of Naples, with uncoordinated but highly motivated groups of partisans striking at the occupiers in any way they could. On the and this is what I mean by the king had the ability and the duty to his people to stand up to the, regardless of how he got in the situation in 44, um, well, this is 43 of the Operation Husky going into 44. Um, he had the duty to 
get the damn army to stop the like the Germans that were coming into his country if you're going to swap sides. He had the prerogative to do so, and he had the right to do so, and also the duty. And as seen here, these are actual Italian soldiers that are still willing to fight and they uh, to kick the Germans out of their country. Not only that, the Allies will have German uh, Italian units um, also be helping them uh, liberate their own country. So the the fact you can't make the you cannot really make the argument that they would have just turned because they didn't because they fought against the anyway Germans anyway. On the third day, the partisans gained the upper hand after corralling Colonel Scholl inside the city stadium, where he was forced to negotiate for the release of Italian prisoners housed there. A day later, the German garrison began to pull out of the city, leaving the partisans battered but victorious and the vital port facilities intact for Allied usage. While the people of Naples made their stand, major events had been taking place further north. After his arrest, Mussolini had been detained in the heavily guarded Gran Sasso mountain complex. The question of what to do with the former Duce was solved for the Allies on September 12th, when German special operative Otto Scorzani rescued Mussolini from captivity and spirited him north to become the Prime Minister of the new Italian Social Republic, also known as the Republic of Salò, or RSI. But Mussolini's failures had hardly left him in good standing with Adolf Hitler, and his new fascist regime was all but completely subordinate to its Nazi counterpart, with Germany seizing the Italian gold reserve and allowing the RSI only a token military force. Okay, let's break this down. This escape attempt, okay. German Fallschirmjägers landed in a comp. This whole rescue for Bonito Mussolini could be its own movie. Let's put it that way. German Fallschirmjägers, again, led by Otto Scorsese, he, he was correct there, um, do land and basically break out Mussolini in an escape movie that really should be made, honestly. Um, now, Mussolini at this time did not want anything to do with running a country. Let's make this very clear. He was voted out and he didn't want to run this republic. And it took days of convincing for him to to uh, people that were talking to him to get him to even attempt to run the northern Italian or the uh, SRI. Um, days to convince this man. And he didn't want to. And then he basically came around to being like, if we're going to be a puppet, it's better that we at least put up a fight so that we're not, you know, we have something to stand on is basically what his model was. He was, he was done. He was out of it. Politically, he, he was not motivated to keep running this thing at all. Mussolini's failures had hardly left him in good standing with Adolf Hitler, and his new fascist regime was all but completely subordinate to its Nazi counterpart, with Germany seizing the Italian gold reserve and allowing the RSI only a token military force. Yes, on top of on top of Mussolini just not wanting to do it, Hitler didn't really want Mussolini to do it either. But it was either him or no one. They were, the Northern Italians weren't gonna they weren't gonna fight for a German puppet. So it was Mussolini or no one, and he chose Mussolini. Mussolini, however, was allowed to recreate his personal militia, who would quickly come to be known as the Brigate Neri, or Black Brigades. Formed expressly to suppress partisan activity, the Black Brigades would operate closely with the German military and assist in many massacres of Italian civilians. This symbol right here, um, this is the Arditi symbol. So basically, they weren't special forces in any sense, in modern sense. But this Arditi with a knife, you know, biting the knife, this is from the First World War, where specialized troops, the mountain guys, would be assault units, basically think stormtroopers um, on the Italian front, and they're called the Arditi. Um, so this is what that's calling back to. Terry ...and assist in many massacres of Italian civilians. But news of these war crimes would strengthen the resolve of the Italian citizenry to resist the RSI, and Mussolini's first conscription campaigns drove thousands of middle-class Italians to flee into the mountains and take up arms against the fascist puppet government. These initial guerrilla bands were primarily composed of communists. Yes. Glad he is saying that. It was, for the most part, Everyone, like 90 to 80 percent of the people in the north that will be partisans are all communists. They will answer to Stalin. If you're a communist in 44, 
43 or 40 really 39 um or even really before that you answered a moscow you answered a stalin you don't answer to anyone else. there's no other you know you answered to stalin so they're all stalinists let's get this very clear they're communists that are going to become stalinists joseph tito is doing his own thing but that's a little different um even he is a stalinist at this point though but to digress there are a lot of communists that will fight back in the north augmented by deserters or Italian soldiers who had managed to keep hold of their weapons. Some were also outright bandits who terrorized the local peasantry for personal enrichment. The situation was made worse by constant Allied bombing campaigns, focused primarily on the three industrial cities of Turin, Milan, and Genoa. In March of 1944, Several hundred thousand Italian workers in Milan went on strike, pleading with the RSI to stop making their nation a target by supplying weapons to Germany. Of course, Mussolini rejected these demands, and the protest was suppressed, with thousands sent to German labor camps. This was the last straw for many Italians, and thousands began flocking to the banner of the CLN. In an effort to reassert dominance, the Germans would retaliate by slaughtering 335 Italians in the Ardiatine Massacre. A few months later, German soldiers and Black Brigade members surrounded the village of St. Anna di Statsema. None of the villagers had been directly implicated in a partisan attack, but the Germans executed 560 of them anyway in an effort to terrorize the rest of the populace into submission. But far from cowing the partisans, the brutality of the RSI and its allies only encouraged more overt resistance. That's the very fine line you draw when you start terrorizing and killing hundreds and hundreds of people. There are two things that will come out of that. One, you either, if their morale is already broken, you will terrorize them into submission. Two, they will fight back very, very hard against you. And you will not crush that resistance. And that's what happens when Germany does all of their war crimes. Could you imagine? Overt resistance. As between the end of 1943 and summer of 1944, partisan membership exploded from fewer than 9,000 to well over 30,000. Due to the distance separating the partisans in the RSI from their counterparts further south, the CLN would establish a new branch in February, creatively named the National Liberation Committee for Northern Italy, or CLNAI. Thanks to increasing Allied support, the CLNAI began to campaign throughout the mountainous regions of northern Italy, using the rough terrain to strike and then melt back into cover. These tactics were remarkably successful, leading Albert Kesselring to estimate that in the summer alone, partisan activity accounted for over 20,000 German and RSI casualties. Unfortunately, this daring campaign would come to an abrupt halt at the start of the winter, when British General Harold Alexander declared the Allied advance would not continue until spring. With intense cold driving the partisans down from the mountains, the RSI was able to make a significant comeback. The CLNAI was also in a difficult position due to the minor detail that 70% of its members were outspoken communists, which made the Western allies distinctly wary of closer cooperation. And that is rightly so. <laughs> this, again, 70, as I said, 80 to 90% were communists. Kind of for this number because of the the killings that have been doing, and yeah, they were communists. They're again the allies at this point are like, oh man, they're unsafe. But uh, yeah, anyway, the allies uh, is, allies are starting to shift in their view that the communists are bad people. Could you imagine? Um, anyway, so yeah, they're gonna stop supplying them, and Alexander's order to halt in the winter just makes you can't advance in the winter. I mean, maybe the Italians you can, but again, fighting in winter with supply lines, no. It's better to build your strength than go on a spring offensive. This led to the signing of the Rome Protocols, where the two halves of the CLN agreed to voluntarily disarm as soon as the liberation was complete, in exchange for the Allies guaranteeing their support while hostilities were ongoing. I wonder which side won't honor that agreement. The spring of 1945 marked the beginning of the end for the Axis in Italy and an escalation of violence between the two sides of the civil war that exceeded anything seen previously. 
In April, the Allies began their final assault on the Gothic Line, accompanied by a message from the Italian Communist Party to the CLNAI, telling them it was time to launch a final insurrection against the RSI. Leveraging their ties to the disaffected workers in Turin, Milan, and Genoa, the Communists went above and beyond expectations, launching a general uprising against the RSI that plunged the whole Po Valley region into anarchy. Mussolini reacted to these events by going into a state of shock, desperately ordering his token military force and black brigades to suppress the rebellion, while dithering between negotiating for his own life and making a glorious last stand of some sort. On the 25th, he left Milan, along with his personal guard, and made a dash for the Valtellina Redoubt at the base of the Alps. Okay. His... The RSI is not a military force. It doesn't exist on Germany. German completely disarmed him. He basically has personal guards and a few police forces. With him. It's good that, that's all he really has. He doesn't have any army units he's commanding with any general at this point. Though he joined up with a retreating column of German soldiers, Mussolini's fate was sealed when partisans attacked and surrounded them. Having no wish to die alongside the dictator, the Germans negotiated for their freedom in exchange for abandoning Mussolini, his mistress, and various other Italian fascists to their fate. Mussolini would be executed within 24 hours and his body put on display for public mockery. It is and they do hang his mistress too. They don't, they don't spare her at all is a testimony to just how completely insignificant Mussolini was at this point that his death was ultimately little more than a footnote in history of the Italian Civil War. Yeah, by the way, Mussolini died. Yeah, I mean, as I said, he really didn't have any power after he got yeeted out of it. I mean, he was just a puppet at that point. And they're like, oh yeah, he died. Woo. With the Germans scrambling to flee Italy, the CLNAI swept up the remnants of the RSI with little effort, with over 250,000 partisans facing less than a tenth of their number in black shirts and fascist loyalists. But the CLNAI was not about to rest on its laurels, and instead raced to establish improvised courts and execute as many members of the old regime as possible before the government in exile could return. This the CLNAI, I remember. The communists, the ones I said, I wonder who won't put their weapons down when they, you know, kick them out. This was a dangerous time for Italy, as some of the hardline communists saw this as a chance to carry Italy into a full socialist revolution. However, cooler heads in the movement knew Britain and America would never tolerate the emergence of a communist nation in the heart of Europe, and even Joseph Stalin condemned the idea. The That's why that president happened, because Joseph Stalin just declared it no. Again, he is in complete control of the communist everywhere um, at this point. Mao to a lesser extent, but everyone in Europe listens to the man. The man says jump, you jump. The man says don't jump, you don't jump. Thus, the Italian Communist Party instead slaked its thirst for fascist blood with its show trials and summary executions before politely cleaning itself up and taking a seat at the table of the new Italian democratic system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll kill all of them. Oh, you wanted a fair? No, nope, we'll just kill you. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to sit at this peace table now. I want my vote. Perhaps seeing the writing on the wall, the exiled Victor Emmanuel III chose to abdicate in May of 1946 and pass the throne on to his son, Umberto II. But with the nation still racked by civil unrest, Umberto decided his best option was to stage a referendum on the continuation of the monarchy. Surprisingly enough, the Republican side squeaked past with just 54% of the vote, but this would have little impact on the momentum of the CLN in post-war circles of power. This Let me go look at this number for you real quick. I'll come back to it. Okay, so uh, looking at the you know, monarchy thing, it said, as had Umberto was the one that wanted this referendum or initiated it, not really. Um, so let's take a look at a few things. So again, these numbers were pretty accurate. Um, they rounded up for the Republicans, apparently. Surprisingly enough, the run of the... So they rounded for 54.3 versus 45.7. Um, so a little bit up, but anyway. <sighs> yes, the monarchists lost, but let's take a look at the map real quick. So again, this is the map of the election. As you can see, the North is clearly in favor of Republicanism. 
the south of Italy is very heavily in favor of keeping the monarchy. And Rome is actually monarchist, if, I, if I'm looking at this map correctly. Um, Rome is monarchist, slightly. Um, but again, the outer. So again, this is just overall. And you can see that Sardinia is also very monarchist. So again, it's a north-south divide that uh, happens in Italy, and this is still a thing even today. It is it is bloody on the politicking. Now, he he does abdicate in favor of his son, um, Emmanuel, or sorry, not Emmanuel, who, King Umbo, Umbo II, but he doesn't abdicate in 46. Uh, well, he does. Okay, let me, let me break this down. So the abdication, as I remember, as I said, it was in 44 that basically he turns over most of his power to the crown prince because he's very not popular. King Emmanuel III is not popular at all. He turns his powers over to his son. His son um, basically runs the monarchy, really, from 44 onward. Um, and he gives his last powers to him as lieutenant general of the realm, blah, blah, blah. Um, then he finally does actually abdicate in 46 in favor of his son. His son is a lot more popular than his dad, obviously. And this um, helps him gain the popularity to at least try to have in favor of the vote. Now, there's a lot of shenanigans that happen in this election. Um, a lot of stuff in the North, you know, people beating monarchists in the North um, and restricting their voting issues and a whole bunch of other stuff that you can read into. But just more or less, <sighs> he lost the election because of the political instability. Um, and if, if what they say is true, that he initiated, probably shouldn't have done so, at least for another few more years for things to cool down, because a lot of people blamed Victor Emmanuel III, quite rightly, that he initiated the fascist government. Um, but they were in favor of his son, and his support was a lot bigger um, than 45.7%. But again, the harassment is what's going to drive this number down. So the vote, but this would have little impact on the momentum of the CLN in post-war circles of power. This was followed by the Togliatti amnesty for both communists and fascists alike on the 22nd of June 1946, drawing a line under the bloody reparations conducted during the last days of the Civil War. For his extraordinary bravery in standing up to Mussolini and his fascist allies in the Palazzo Venezia, Dino Grandi would spend most of the rest of his life in quiet exile before returning to Italy shortly before his death. While many nations during the Second World War played host to partisan movements and collaborationist governments, Italy stands out as unique for the extent to which brother fought against brother. Though both the Allied and Axis forces did their best to prevent Italian soldiers from the RSI and co-belligerent armies from clashing, no such effort was made to keep the fascist black brigades and partisans away from each other's throats. Even today, the Italian socialist movements define themselves by the experiences shared during the Civil War, and still maintain a prominent place in Italian political circles. Meanwhile, Mussolini's grave is the site of fascist gatherings every year, with a small yet still significant number of Italians still holding sympathy for a man they view as having lifted Italy out of the Great Depression and into the modern era. Yet perhaps the greatest lesson of the Italian Civil War is that even a nation forced to undergo massive economic and social upheaval can hold together and rebuild. Yeah, very, very good video and very true. Um, Italian is a little bit unstable even today, but yes, they did rebuild after the war, obviously, and they're still a country to today. So, yes, the civil war that happens in Italy is quite unique in the fact that it... You could compare it to the Yugoslavs, which basically they're going to do after <laughs> or during right now, uh, the during World War II, but again, brother against brother in, Itali in Italia. So, hope you guys liked that video. Hope you like my reaction to me adding stuff there. Otherwise, uh, please like the video, and you can check out the next video, which should be up there, which will be the Battle of Berlin, if it is out. Uh, otherwise, I'll see people later, and have a good rest of your day.